So we're going to get started here. So I'm talking to you guys about immune-related disorders of the adnexa and ocular surface. And there are a lot of them. This is the list. This is not even the full list. I took off some like real zebras that I didn't think were as important. Um, but I'm not going to spend a whole huge amount of time on each of them, but there's a few that I will spend a little bit of more time on. But we'll go through the rest pretty quickly. Um, so this is the order I think they were in in BCSC, so it's kind of random to me. It's not even by severity. But we are starting with something not so severe, contact dermatitis. So this is a, um, can be a type 1 reaction um, if it is um, occurring within minutes, um, and that is considered anaphylactic. Um, I think more commonly it's a type 4 reaction, which is T cell mediated, which is about 24 to 72 hours after exposure to the um, allergic agent. Um, symptoms are eyelid redness, swelling, severe itching. Signs will be erythema and scaling of the eyelids. Uh, treatment is discontinuing the offending agent if we know what it is. Unfortunately, I think most of the time we don't know what they are just because there's a lot of um, possibilities for things that touch your face if you think about it. Um, but even if we can't really identify what the offending agent is, I recommend cool compresses and then some sort of topical steroid ointment or topical like antibiotic and steroid ointment uh, for a week or two. Um, atopic dermatitis is similar, but this is chronic um, and it does begin in childhood. Um, and this is a type four um, hypersensitivity with increased IgE hypersensitivity and increased histamine release. Um, symptoms are itching. There are usually lesions on the eyelids as well as other locations such as arms and legs. Um, and there's a history of other atopic disorders such as asthma and allergic rhinitis. Um, symptoms are scaling of the skin, some periorbital darkening, which is shown in the picture, um, and also some exaggerated eyelid folds. Uh, treatment is uh, minimizing environmental um, allergens and also food allergens. Um, using moisturizing lotions. The acute lesions can be treated with topical steroids, um, but you don't want to use those long term because there's a side effect of skin thinning. Um, long term, you might consider a uh, tacrolimus ointment because that, that has fewer side effects. Um, consider oil, oral um, antihistamines and then consulting a allergist. Um, allergic conjunctivitis, very common. This is an IgE mediated um, hypersensitivity reaction. Um, typically, this is going to be something airborne, so pollen, weeds, um, something in the environment, um, usually seasonal. Um, symptoms are itching, swelling, redness, and um, kind of a mucoid discharge. Uh, you can also see chemosis, which is seen in the bottom picture, um, but the most common finding is going to be a papillary conjunctivitis. So treatment, um, again, decreasing exposure to allergens. Um, consider doing some massive cleaning of bedding, carpets, air filters, um, cool compresses, artificial tears, topical antihistamines or mast cell stabilizers, but you do have to warn people that um, if they do have concurrent dry eyes, that that, that can worsen their dry eyes. Um, you could consider a short-term course of steroids. Um, you might consider topical cyclosporin like Restasis um, and, and systemic antihistamines, but again, warn patients about worsening dry eye. Um, next is vernal keratoconjunctivitis, which is bilateral, it's seasonal, most often in male um, children, um, but it could be year-round in tropical climates. This is type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity. Um, symptoms, again, itching, photophobia. They can also have blurred vision, and they can have a copious mucoid discharge. Um, and the appearance is rather um, striking. So um, on the palpebral conge, there'll be um, uh, pretty much almost like a GPC look on their upper uh, tarsal conjunctiva. Um, they may have some chemosis present. And then along the limbus, uh, you'll see this in, usually in, in kids of African or Asian descent, where the limbus has this kind of gelatinous um, nodular appearance. Um, and Horner trantus dots is kind of a buzzword that you'll see on tests. So these are little white areas of degenerated eosinophils and epithelial cells. So you'll see this typically on the superior um, limbus, but you'll see this all the way around 360. Um, so for mild disease, um, topical antihistamines, um, mast cell stabilizers, 
stabilizers, usually they do need um, more intensive therapy than this. So usually um, topical steroids, they do respond quite well to topical steroids, but I usually like to start at a high dose and then rapidly taper down. Um, if it seems like they're um, still flaring, you might consider um, topical um, cyclosporin 2% or uh, tacrolimus ointment as well. Um, you might also consider supratarsal injection of steroid. I haven't done this because usually this occurs in kids who are not going to be kind of sitting still for this as an outpatient, but that's something that could be considered for very recalc recalcitrant cases. Um, atopic keratoconjunctivitis. So this occurs in one third of patients with atopic dermatitis. Um, again, this is a type 4 reaction. There's depressed cell mediated immunity. Um, they are susceptible to HSV and coloniz colonization of their lids with staph. Um, the patients who get um, atopic disease are going to be typically older than those with uh, uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis. It is year round. The papillae are smaller than what you see in vernal. And I'll show some pictures of all this later on, but um, they'll have kind of a milky conjunctival. Um, edema look with some sub epithelial fibrosis. They can get conjunctival scarring and some blepharos, so this is not a benign um, disease. They can also get PSC cataracts, um, shield ulcers on the cornea, which are kind of usually a response to the uh, papillae on the uh, upper tarsal conge. They can get cornea neovascularization. Um, and there are associations of this with keratoconus and pellucid. Um, so this is kind of showing some subepithelial fibrosis here and also papillae. This is some massive corneal neovascularization, very thickened eyelids, and there may be some symblepharon going here. Um, and then this is an example of a shield ulcer, um, which is going to be like a chronic corneal epithelial defect usually found superiorly. Um, treatment is, again, allergen avoidance. It's the same treatment as with vernal, so topical um, allergy medication, uh, topical steroids, typically. Um, you do want to watch for secondary herpes or staph infections. Um, in very severe cases, they may actually need systemic immunosuppression, like oral cyclosporin. Okay, I'll spend a little bit more time on Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, just because this is one of the, if you see this acutely and you diagnose it, it's, diagnose it, it's something that you can actually treat to prevent um, further complications um, on the ocular surface. So this is a rare, potentially life-threatening immune complex um, hypersensitivity disorder that's triggered by medications or infectious organisms. It's quite rare. The incidence is one to seven cases per million, but you will see it here um, at the burning occasionally. Um, you'll have sloughing of the skin and mucous membranes, and they actually simulate partial thickness burns, which is why patients get transferred to burn centers. Um, it can affect anyone of any age. Um, usually it's caused by medication, and um, sulfa um, is a, um, and like Bactrim are a big uh, culprit, but also anti-epileptic meds, allopurinol, even something as benign as NSAIDs or Tylenol has also been um, um, in etiology. And 15% uh, of the time, it's from an infectious cause, the most common being mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, also HSV, adenovirus, and histoplasma. So when it first starts out, it's actually a very nonspecific um, set of symptoms um, for up to two weeks. So there's malaise, fever is a big, um, big thing that happens, and they have chills, they have headaches, um, and then usually at this time they'll get exposed to um, medication as well. So it's hard to really know, you know, pinpoint what the exact etiology is. Is it a medication that they take because of brewing Stevens-Johnson or was it from something else? Um, and then after this two-week period, then they get a very diffuse progressive rash. They'll get um, erythematous macules that progress to bullae and vesicles, and the epidermis is very easily separated from the underlying dermis. And then mucosal erosions affect 90% and affects all mucosal um, areas, um, oropharyngeal mucosa, ocular surface, GI tract, and GU tract. And so this is actually a spectrum of disease, depending on how um, widespread it um, spreads. So first is erythema multiforme, which is um, a detachment of less than 10% of total body surface area, um, and they may have localized typical target lesions. Um, the definition of um, 
SJS, uh, Stevens Johnson syndrome, is detachment of less than 10% body surface area plus widespread erythematous and purpuric macules. Uh, mortality rate is only 5%, but that goes up um, quite high with more progress progression of the disease. So SJS and um, toxic epidermal necrosis overlap is 10 to 30% total body surface area involvement. And then um, full-blown um, TENS is greater than 30% um, surface area involvement, and the mortality rate of that is actually 35 to 40%. So this is what patients will look like. They'll be sick, they're in, they're in the burn unit, they're on oxygen. Um, this is a woman who, I mean, when you look at the picture on the left, and for some reason my mouse is not here, but when you look at the picture on the left, it looks like there's kind of blood all over her face, and that's actually because she has no skin. So that is her dermis that you're looking at over her whole face. On the right, um, this woman um, hasn't sloughed off um, too much of her face, but she actually has pretty severe um, um, oropharyngeal involvement. So um, her eyes are involved, and also her mouth is pretty involved. Um, acute eye findings. So there are ocular surface um, findings involved in 67 to 81 percent of patients. So we believe that all, pretty much all patients should be screened. Um, with uh, for ocular um, symptoms if they are diagnosed with Stevens-Johnson. Um, but there can be variable pre presentation. Some people may not have any ocular um, signs. Some may have only mild, or they have a little bit of conjunctivitis, maybe a little bit of redness. Um, and it can progress to severe, which is um, diffuse, extensive mucosal inflammation, um, pseudomembrane um, formation, which are these kind of membranes here, um, which are it's basically their tarsal conjunctiva separating um, and sloughing off. They'll have um, epithelial sloughing of their eyelids and also lash loss. Um, the late uh, ocular complications are what we really um, kind of fear with Stevens-Johnson <coughs> syndrome. They can have very extensive some blepharon formation, eyelid deformities, um, ankyloblepharon, where basically the eyelids kind of almost fuse, fuse together. Very severe dry eye um, because you have destruction of um, the goblet cells and also the meibomian glands. There's limbal stem cell deficiency, corneal neovascularization that can lead to um, thinning and perforation. Um, keratinization along the eyelid margins is something that happens a lot, um, as well as scarring of their tarsal conjunctiva. And um, if they have severe corneal involvement and you want to do something like a transplant, it's a very high risk. Um, transplant because it's prone to rejection and failure. Um, even a cure to prosthesis or an artificial cornea is very prone to um, thinning, perforation, um, just because the um, ocular surface is so dry. Um, so in mild disease, the medical management, uh, there's actually medical management. So we recommend frequent preservative-free artificial tears and ointment. Um, depending on how the eye looks, you could consider sweeping the uh, fornices for pseudomembranes. So just take, I use a cotton tip. I mean, classically, they say use a glass rod, which I don't know where you find one of those, but um, cotton tip and just run it along the, uh, the fornices to sweep for pseudomembranes. Um, if there's large corneal epithelial defects, putting in a bandaged contact lens, um, and then um, using topical prednisolone and, um, and or restasis. Um, but then what's recommended um, if there's more severe disease is actually urgent amniotic membrane transplantation. So um, amniotic membrane is from the innermost layer of the placenta, and um, there are different forms of it. It can be dried or um, it can be cryopreserved. So when it's cryopreserved, um, we feel that it's really um, kind of a lot more beneficial for these people, uh, these patients. So it's actually acting as a substitute for the ocular surface. So these, these patients have sloughed their entire ocular mucosa, and we're trying to replace it. Um, but we're not only replacing it, we're trying to get some anti-inflammatory um, treatment directly to the ocular surface. There are growth factors, anti-inflammatory cytokines found within the amniotic membrane. And there's various methods of actually applying the, the, the amniotic membrane to the ocular surface. Um, most commonly for these cases, it's sutured. Um, could consider gluing it. Um, there are not. There are sutureless ways to apply it to certain areas of the ocular surface as well, and it promotes re-epithelialization of the ocular surface, reduces inflammation, um, prevents simbleform formation, and it naturally does degrade over one to two weeks. And depending on how severe it is, after the amniotic membrane degrades, it may have to be repeated if there's still significant inflammation. 
Um, so it's typically performed if there are corneal epithelial defects, if there are pseudomembranes, and if there's moderate or severe conjunctival um, injection. Um, perform within two weeks of the onset of symptoms. And I would recommend performing within one week if possible, just because the earlier um, you intervene, the better the outcomes are. Um, Postoperatively, doing some topical antibiotics, prednisolone, restasis, um, Tobradex ointment at night, and we also recommend um, Q8 saline flushes just to kind of flush um, everything off the ocular surface. Um, and again, amniac, the amniac membrane transplantation can be repeated later on. Um, actually, it was part of a study at, when I was at Loyola where we looked at, um, it was a chart review of 128 um, Stevens-Johnson patients um, who were admitted and they were biopsy proven. Um, and we had graded their ocular surface as mild, moderate, severe. And then these patients were either treated medically or with amniotic membrane. Um, and, you know, amniotic membrane hasn't really been um, used maybe only in the past, I think 10 years ago is when they when we first started doing it. So it was kind of a nice way to see how, um, compare how patients were, how patients did before amniotic membrane was employed versus after. Um, and then the, peop the patients were graded um, as good, fair, or poor as far as outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna go over all the results of the study, but this is one result that we had, which was looking at patients with moderate to severe inflammation. Um, and we, there were actually 23 eyes who were treated at the amniotic membrane and 23 eyes that were medically managed. Um, and we found that um, the patients who had early amniotic membrane transplant, um, most patients had the good or fair um, outcome. So there was only one eye that had a poor outcome after amniotic membrane. Whereas patients who had no amniotic membrane transplant, there were eight eyes um, who did not do as well. So the, these were the eight eyes in the poor category. Um, and this was within three months, and then after three months, the results were not as statistically significant. There's a higher p-value, but the results were similar. Um, but actually in, I think it was last month's ophthalmology, there was a new grading system that came out for Stevens-Johnson, and it was a nice way to kind of um, help see what to do for certain um, uh, grading um, uh, diagnoses. So mild SJS was defined as pretty much no staining of the lid margin, no staining of the cornea, um, hyperemia of the conjunctiva with no stain, and the treatment recommendation there is medical. Um, moderate disease was defined as staining of less than one-third of the lid margin, no staining on the cornea, um, and then small staining was okay on the conjunctiva, less than one centimeter. Um, and this could also be observed and treated medically. Um, and then there was severe and extremely severe, and both of these required um, urgent amniotic membrane transplants. So um, for both severe and extremely severe, it was greater than um, one-third of the lid margin. Um, any epithelial defect, more than punctate staining, um, automatically put patients in the severe or extremely severe category. Um, staining greater than one centimeter put you in the severe category. Multiple areas of staining greater than one centimeter was considered extremely severe. Um, so again, both of these categories required urgent amniotic membrane transplantation, and the extremely severe may require repeat surgery. Do you like follow that? Would you follow that treatment recommendation? Like, um, I think so. I mean, I the way we had graded things at Loyola was we we a lot we would observe if there was a small like corneal epithelial defect like less than um, 25 percent of the cornea we would observe um, but with uh, Darren Gregory he's an out of um, Denver he felt that you needed to be a lot more aggressive so I may follow this now that this is kind of the newer treatment guideline so you really wouldn't consider doing like amnion until like until they've got corneal staining um, yeah, corneal staining or ext extensive lid margin staining. This one doesn't really talk about pseudomembranes, but I think by the time you get to pseudomembranes, you are having massive staining of the conjunctiva. Yeah. And then, like, sorry, if it's like, yeah. like mostly conjunctival, like would you, I don't know, like if I had a kid like the, here this past week that had um, like the mycoplasma mucositis and like had no corneal staining, but had like a decent amount of like conching it. So it would be like moderate mm. based on this definition. Like would you ever yeah. do like a Procura for that? I know it no, because really Procura, 
The carrot only covers cornea and like a little bit of the conge. So if their problem is mostly conjunctival, like probably have to do the full thing. Or you could watch them and then if they have any sign of any corneal involvement, then jump to amniotic membrane. Yeah. Um, okay, I think treatment guidelines we talked about, mild and moderate disease can be managed medically, severe or very severe should undergo amniotic membrane. Um, in this new study that had come out, um, the severe cases all had outcomes of best corrective visual acuity of 2020 and mild or no um, dry eye symptoms. And then the very severe cases still did really well. Nine out of 10 had 20-20 uh, vision. Seven out of 10 had mild or no dry eye symptoms. Um, three out of 10 had, uh, did have moderate um, lid margin scarring and dry eyes and severe photophobia. So they weren't completely um, normal, but there were a lot better than the patients who have very severe semblepharon who don't see well. So. Um, this shows that the treatment actually works. Yeah. For the very severe cases, how often are you recommending, or are they recommending to, to replace the amniotic membrane? Um, I think once, so once the amniotic membrane dissolves or gets incorporated, and if they're still, if they still like say, fit into the severe or very severe inflammation category, then retreat. But if they are calmed down, where they're now like mild or moderate, then you can observe. Okay, so that was SJS, so we're gonna to move to mucous membrane pemphigoid. Um, so this was formerly known as ocular secretricial pemphigoid, or OCP, but I think a lot of people still refer to it as OCP, because no one knows what you're talking about when you say MMP. <laughs> um, so this represents a type two uh, cytotoxic hypersensitivity reaction, and it's a chronic cicatrizing conjunctivitis of autoimmune etiology. And it frequently affects other mucosal membranes, mouth, or pharynx, and genitalia. Uh, difficulty swallowing is an early symptom. It affects women more than men uh, in a two to one ratio. And usually you'll see this in elderly patients. Okay. Um, so the stages of mucous membrane pemphigoid. So stage one is subepithelial fibrosis, which you see here. Um, stage two is fornicial foreshortening. So if you only pull down their lid, you'll notice that the fornix doesn't go down as far as normal because you'll see some scarring along the fornix. Um, stage three, there's simple frond formation. And stage four, there's extensive adhesions to the eyelid and globe. So this patient is stage four. She's got some blepharon. She's got some adhesions to the, uh, to the globe here, um, from her eyelid to the globe. And she also has um, corneal um, scarring. So the diagnosis is to take a, do a conjunctival biopsy. Um, and ideally, you want to take this from a non-scarred area, so non, uh, what looks to be a non-affected area, um, so not a symblepharon area. And you send this off for direct immunofluorescent staining. There's a special media they have to place the tissue in. And then you'll see basement membrane staining of IgG, IgM, IgA, and or complement 3, which you see along here. And then you do want to work with either dermatology and or rheumatology for systemic uh, treatment. For mild cases, this is just oral dapsone. For more severe cases, this could involve um, cyclophosphamide, rituxan, or other um, immunosuppressive agents. Um, you want to really delay surgical repair until the disease is quiescent because it, um, because the, there's so much scarring that if you were to um, aggressively try and um, repair them surgically, they're just going to scar up more and end up being worse. Um, eyelid repair is often needed. Um, these patients don't do well with, um, with any sort of um, transplant. Um, they may need limbal stem cell transplant, even then they don't do well, and, even, and they might need a keratoprosthesis, and those also have a high rate of failure. Um, next is graft versus host disease. So this occurs in patients who have undergone um, allogeneic uh, hematologic stem cell transplant. Um, ocular disease is uh, the more common form in chronic forms of GVHD. And what happens is that the donor lymphocytes start to attack the host histocompatibility complexes. And 40 to 90 percent, depending on the study, um, of patients with GVHD will have ocular involvement. Um, so this is a T-cell mediated process that leads to infiltration and inflammation of the lacrimal gland, conjunctiva, and ocular surface. So they typically have very um, severe dry eye um, because of this. Um, so that leads to decreased goblet cell density, scarring of the lacrimal gland and conjunctiva, 
ribomian gland dysfunction and scarring, and limbo stem cell deficiency. Um, so these are just some examples. I mean, there's very kind of dry eye. You can see the diffuse punctate epithelial staining. There, um, your ocular surface is very inflamed. And when it's chronic, it can lead to some extensive new, uh, corneal neovascularization. So treatment is going to be just very, very aggressive dry eye treatment. Very aggressive lubrication, punctal occlusion, um, topical uh, cyclosporin, topical steroids, um, and then working with their um, with their hematologist or oncologist for um, increased systemic immunosuppression um, may be needed. Um, next is Tigesen's superficial punctate keratitis. Um, so this is of unknown etiology, and there are recurring episodes of Turing, foreign body sensation, pho photophobia, and blurred vision. Um, and it affects kind of people of a very wide age range. It's usually bilateral, but it may be very asymmetric. And the signs are going to be these um, small, kind of slightly elevated corneal epithelial lesions um, that will stain with fluorescein and rose bengal with minimal conjunctival inflammation. So I've got some pictures here. So when you talk about SPK, depending on who you talk to, I mean, really, to me, SPK really refers to this. So um, I was taught that SPK shouldn't really be um, applied to kind of dry eye in general um, because it's more specific for this particular syndrome. So you'll see these multiple very small dots in the epithelium that do stain with fluorescein. And you can have a little, sometimes you can have a little bit of haze around the dots as well. So it looks looks different than the dry eye punctate epithelial erosions because these are a little more, a little wider. Um, they're a little kind of more elevated um, because in dry eye you'll see kind of excavation of punctate epithelial erosions, whereas here they're a little bit elevated. Um, they typically respond very well to topical steroids, and you could also consider topical cyclosporin. However, it tends to recur um, multiple times over several years. Um, so it's kind of something that keeps happening, and people have kind of looked into viral etiologies, but nothing's really panned out for sure. <clears throat> Um, interstitial keratitis is a non-separative inflammation of the corneal stroma. Um, it usually has um, neovascularization without involvement of the epithelium or endothelium. And it usually results from a type 4 hypersensitivity response to some sort of infectious agent or other um, antigens in the corneal stroma. Most commonly you'll see this in HSV, um, also zoster, um, syphilis, and there are a lot of other rare causes such as TB and Lyme. Um, but um, most cases you actually see it with syphilis and it will be with congenital syphilis um, and this is kind of a later immune mediated manifestation of congenital syphilis and it develops late in the first decade of life um, and there's a stromal keratitis that lasts for several weeks it's usually bilateral um, if you have acquired syphilis it rarely develops um, but if it does it's typically unilateral um, symptoms will be pain, tearing, photophobia, some perilimbal injection. Um, you'll see some sectoral stromal inflammation and KPs. Um, there will be a deep um, stromal new vascularization seen later in the course, and the cornea may appear pink and it's termed a salmon patch, which is kind of another buzzword that you'll see on tests. Um, inflammation spreads centrally with opacification and edema, and the sequelae are corneal scarring, thinning, and ghost vessels in a deep stroma. Um, so this is showing some extensive um, corneal, neo corneal neovascularization and scarring. And then on the right, you'll see um, the ghost vessels. Um, so there were a lot of vessels there. And then when they regress, um, you'll see um, the remnants of the prior vessels. Um, diagnosis and treatment. So you want to test for syphilis with blood tests. Um, in the acute phase, you also want to apply uh, topical steroids and cycloplegics. Um, if it's untreated, the disease actually does burn out on its own, but after several weeks. Um, systemic syphilis should be treated with penicillin um, as uh, neurosyphilis, and you want to work with your um, infectious disease specialist for that. Um, next is Kogan syndrome. This is our rare syndrome, but it's an autoimmune disorder that's characterized by stromal keratitis, vertigo, and hearing loss. Um, this is, again, something that has an unknown etiology, but it does share some features of um, polyarteritis nodosa, and it typically occurs in young adults one to two weeks after an upper respiratory infection. 
Um, so the signs will be, you know, early on there'll be some bilateral faint white subepithelial infiltrates in the periphery, um, and later on there'll be some multifocal nodular infiltrates in the posterior cornea. And then some patients de develop a systemic vasculitis that presents as polyarteritis nodosa. And there's no real specific diagnostic test for this. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, treatment was with steroids um, for their vestibular auditory symptoms. Um, oral steroids can enhance prognosis for normal hearing. Um, for very severe cases, they might require some um, immuno systemic immunosuppression. Um, this is a very common thing that you'll see, marginal corneal infiltrate. So like I said, this is a very random order, but this is what it was in BCSC. Um, so marginal corneal infiltrates occur in the peripheral cornea where the basically areas where the eyelid margin intersects the cornea, so like at 10 and 2 and 8 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Um, and they're typically very well-defined gray-white anterior stromal infiltrates that have a little bit of a clear zone um, from the limbus, and there may or may not be an epithelial defect. Um, the treatment is going to be a combination of topical antibiotics and steroids. And here are some kind of classic appearances. This is pretty classic for a staph marginal infiltrate. Um, this one is not as classic because there's so many, um, but you can have multiple ones like this, and you can have variable, um, I guess, distances of a clear zone. This one may be a little bit more central than typical, and these may be just a little bit more peripheral than what is typical. Um, next is peripheral ulcerative keratitis, or PUK. So this occurs in autoimmune disease, most often with rheumatoid arthritis, but it can occur with Wegener's lupus, um, polyarteritis nodosa, and ulcerative colitis. Um, you do need to work these up if there's no known autoimmune disease. It's usually unilateral, but they can be bilateral. You can have paracentral thinning, so it doesn't have to be peripheral, but with rheumatoid arthritis, it's actually, I think, more common to have paracentral thinning than it is to have peripheral thinning. And it's usually painless, or they may only just have mild discomfort. Um, so this is um, pretty severe PUK that you can see in the periphery here. Um, in this case, there's some chronic PUK that's occurred inferiorly. You can see a lot of blood vessels growing in. And then this is the area of paracentral thinning. Um, so the treatment is they're going to need some more aggressive systemic immunosuppression, so work with their rheumatologist to do that. Um, increase lubrication, drops, ointment, punctal plugs. Um, oral tetracycline class antibiotics such as minocycline and doxycycline can inhibit collagenases and kind of prevent further thinning of the corneal stroma. Um, typically, classically, you're not supposed to put on topical steroids because that can exacerbate thinning and delay epithelial healing. If you're getting to a point where there's a desmetacea or a small perforation, they may need to be glued, um, and they may need a patch graft um, if they're perforated or if there's a larger perforation of corneal transplant. Um, but uh, they typically don't do as well unless they have very, very aggressive systemic immunosuppression um, after their transplant. A morin ulcer is a type of PUK, but it's of unknown origin. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, there are some factors um, that would, might make you, make you think that you have a morin ulcer, but the precipitating factors are going to be tra prior trauma, um, exposure to paras uh, parasitic infections, because there's thought to be some cross-reactivity of the immune reaction to parasites with corneal autoantigens, and some cases may have an association with hepatitis C. Um, so the signs are going to be a painful red eye, and it usually is going to be starting in the corneal periphery and then spread circumferentially and then spread kind of more centrally. And the classic sign, which I'll show you a picture of later, is a leading overhanging edge in the cornea. And there can be, it can be unilateral or it can be bilateral. So when it's unilateral, you'll typically see in older patients, it's slowly progressive. Um, you'll see an equal um, uh, distribution between male and female. Um, the bilateral type is more common in African males. It's rapidly progressive. It responds very poorly to treatment, and perforations can occur, so it's a lot more aggressive. So here are a couple examples of murin ulcers. So this is that overhanging edge, and it'll be a very kind of well-defined kind of white edge. Um, and it's really seen here. I mean, here you can see it's like a cliff, um, and then kind of this excavated area underneath. So um, there's variable success with topical steroids, cyclosporin, bandage contact lens. 
Um, patients may need to undergo a limbal conjunctival excision, um, kind of in the area where the disease is occurring, so excising um, the limbal uh, conjunctival area and then allowing that to recess. Um, they often do need, um, or they might need a lamellar keratoplasty as well. Um, they often do need systemic immunosuppression and um, consider systemic interferon if associated with hepatitis C. So again, this is something you'd have to consult your infectious disease specialist. Um, corneal transplant rejection. So this is something that can occur greater than one month after a transplant and up to 20 years after a transplant. And 80% of cases can be reversed with intense topical subconjunctival and or oral steroids. Um, so this is why um, patients do need some sort of immunosuppression for their corneal transplant. So it's usually going to be topical steroids. But um, for very high-risk patients who are prone to rejection, they may need systemic immunosuppression. Um, corneal neovascularization um, does increase the risk of rejection up to greater than 50%. Um, and uh, you could consider some topical and subconjunctival anti vegf agents. Um, there are a few types of corneal transplant rejections. There is epithelial, where there's an elevated um, kind of epithelial ridge that's caused by lymphocytes. Um, usually it's in the first year after a PK, um, and this is more uncommon. Um, subepithelial, there'll be subepithelial infiltrates. Um, stromal rejection, not as common, um, but there'll be stromal infiltrates, um, some thinning of the stroma, and that may lead to necrosis. Uh, endothelia is the most common, um, and it's the most serious form because that can lead to a loss of endothelial cells, which can lead to chronic corneal edema or graft failure. And the um, buzzword here is the cuda deuced line, which is uh, inflammatory precipitates on the endothelial surface. Um, and it may be in a line under corneal edema, and anterior chamber cell is common. So I'm going to show a picture here. So this is a picture of a cuda deuce line. This is in the endothelial surface, um, and this is showing some um, stromal and subepithelial kind of diffuse haziness of the cornea. So there are different ways to prevent rejection. Um, at the time of surgery, you could consider um, putting in a smaller graft that's further away from the limbus. Um, I typically will recommend that patients are on topical steroids forever after the corneal transplant. However, you'll see a lot of people who are no longer taking topical steroids because they're, you know, they had their transplant like 10, 15 years ago. For those patients, I usually won't restart them if they've been doing well. Um, but if they ever have any sort of rejection, then I tell people they need to be on steroids for life. Um, you do want to remove any broken or loose sutures because that irritation can induce um, not only infection, but also rejection. Okay, next is episcleritis. Um, common condition is usually self-limited. It's a benign inflammation of episcleral tissues. Um, the minority of cases are associated with a systemic cause. So I don't usually work up patients with episcleritis unless they're coming in with like very recurrent episcleritis, then I'll do a full workup. Um, the symptoms will be um, some redness, usually not very irritated. There may or may not be any tenderness. That's very slight. Um, it can be diffuse or it can be nodular. Um, it's bright red in natural light. And the redness actually blanches five minutes after the, the install, installation of topical phenylephrine. So that's a nice kind of diagnostic tool to differentiate between episcleritis and scleritis. Um, so like I said, consider workup if the um, condition is recurrent. Um, there are some systemic associations, but they're all less than 10%. So it can be associated with herpes zoster, collagen vascular disease, gout, or syphilis. Um, episcleritis is something that will actually resolve without treatment. So even if you don't really do anything, it's going to get better on its own. Um, but if you do do something, you could consider a short course of topical steroids or, um, and or oral NSAIDs to speed the resolution. Okay, so you want to differentiate episcleritis from scleritis. So scleritis is severe ocular inflammation that's going to be, have a high association with systemic autoimmune or infectious disease, and it can lead to a destruction of scleral tissue in certain cases. Um, half of cases of, of scleritis are bilateral at some point during the course, um, and this is not going to get better if you don't do anything. It has to be treated um, to uh, achieve resolution. So the symptoms are going to be severe pain and redness, this will be some, a pain that's so severe that it often awake, awakens um, people from sleep. 
And instead of that bright red that you'll see with episcleritis, this is kind of more of a purplish hue. Um, and it's got this deep violaceous hue in natural light. Um, the globe is very tender to touch. Um, so you can see this is very inflamed. So there are different types of scleritis. This is non-necrotizing scleritis. And this can be diffuse or nodulous. So it can be um, sectoral or it can be um, involving the whole seg uh, anterior segment. It can be nodular where there's actually a scleral nodule present. Um, necrotizing scleritis without inflammation, and the other name for this is scleromalacia perforans. So this is a painless um, uh, type of scleritis. And there's a white to quiet eye, but there's thin sclera. And you'll see this in elderly patients. It's typically bilateral. 50% um, of these are from rheumatoid arthritis. And scleral rupture is rare um, in these cases, and it rarely needs surgical repair. Whereas necrotizing scleritis with inflammation is a lot more serious. This is painful. Um, it's bilateral in most cases. Um, it is highly destructive with vision loss in 40%. There's high association with systemic vasculitis such as Wegener's. Um, the mortality rate is actually 20% at five years if you do see um, necrotizing scleritis with inflammation. So you can see this little photo montage of different um, very severe cases of um, necrotizing scleritis with inflammation, so very thin sclera and a lot of inflammation. Um, posterior scleritis can occur in isolation or with anterior scleritis. Um, however, with posterior scleritis, often even after a full workup, no um, systemic disease can be found. Um, the symptoms will be pain, which may be referred pain. There may be some proptosis, tenderness, vision loss, um, and restricted motility. Um, and the signs are choroidal folds on dilated exam. Um, they can have an exudative RD, and they can also have papilledema. Um, and then the T sign on B scan ultrasound is the classic sign in posterior scleritis. So this is, I'm trying to get my mouse here, the T sign here. So this results from kind of a uh, severely thickened sclera, and then you'll see kind of the optic nerve coming back. Um, this one is showing some uh, choroidal detachments there. And complications of scleritis, whether it is um, anterior or posterior, can be significant. So you can get a peripheral keratitis, you can get uveitis, glaucoma, cataract, scleral thinning. Um, a sclerokeratitis, where you have actual opacification of your peripheral cornea um, by, um, that's associated with a neighboring area of scleritis. Um, and, and sclerokeratitis is more common in zoster scleritis. Um, so the workup uh, may have to be um, tailored um, according to the review of SIP systems. So you can check a CBC, ESR, CRP, um, ANA, rheumatoid factor, and ANCAs, uric acid, uh, check for syphilis, check for TB, and check for sarcoid. Um, so the treatment, some mild anterior scleritis may be treated but just with oral NSAIDs. Um, usually, though, you want to use oral steroids and then refer to a rheumatologist for treatment uh, for systemic immunosuppression, um, and they may start them on a variety of um, different um, agents depending on what the etiology is. And that is it.